Welcome back to a very, uh, I guess I should say, actually cut right there. <laughs> just screwed up there. I don't know why. Good morning and welcome to another Tuesday edition of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Uh, today we are going to be doing another one of our community spotlights. We are going to be talking to community organizations over the next few months, over the next few years, and we're going to be shining a spotlight on them because I think sometimes we need to do that. As a relatively new person to Calgary, it's always awesome to hear from community organizations from them directly. So today we're going to be talking to Larry Leach in studio, as you can see via the video, uh, the executive director for 12 CSI. Um, Larry, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Uh, it's an honor for an invite. Thank you. Uh, Larry, I, uh, for those who don't know, who are listening to this right now, and for those who are outside of the 12 CSI area, what is 12 CSI? Well, we're essentially a crime prevention organization, which of course is a big, broad swath. But we, we try and do education and uh, intervention programs uh, in our 12 communities in East Calgary and basically the communities uh, that we chose were District 4 of the Calgary Police Service so we didn't uh, we didn't waver from from their map and so we we do a number of great programs we have some traffic safety videos on uh, on YouTube that we've had translated into several languages including one indigenous language which is Stony Nakoda we hope to get more of those translated uh, I was talking to you earlier about Audacity. That's what we used to translate our videos uh, with. The translators send us a, a, a wave file from Audacity, and then we link it up with the video. Um, the biggest thing we've got going right now is our ambassador program. So uh, I'm wearing a nice little purple jacket here. Um, they are out on the streets uh, on International Avenue uh, helping folks. So whether it's with directions, simple things like that, uh, whether it's a little uh, minor first aid, uh, or whether it's uh, to help some vulnerable folks find some pro uh, some services and supports uh, along the avenue. That's what our ambassadors are, are doing. S um, we were um, inspired by the downtown ambassador program and uh, took that model and now we're building uh, uh, East Calgary model, which um, started um, in August. So we're still in that new car smell kind of, <laughs> kind of thing um we also have a newsletter quarterly newsletter and it, it, one of the things i think uh, I, I don't know whether it's a skill of mine or whether it's the organization or a bit of both but we seem to be able to find a gap somewhere and fill it and so when i became the executive director uh, almost five years ago i recognized right away that not all 12 of our communities had a printed community newsletter in fact very few of them I think we had two at the time now one uh, so we decided to put out a newsletter so that we could get community news because connecting people to community is the utmost in safety if you know if you have a couple of trusted friends and you know your neighbors that automatically makes you safer it makes you feel safer yeah um, but it also in time of trouble you, you need that one or two people that you can count on and call and so anytime we try and connect people to community that is all part of, of safety and, and what we do now for those who are listening and those who are watching the um the 12 communities that larry has just mentioned i'm gonna ri li uh, list them off here because for those people who are watching in Ca uh, outside of calgary you probably don't know what east calgary looks like so um the, the 12 communities is abbeydale which includes Ch chateau estates yep. did i pronounce that right uh albert park radisson heights applewood calgary maltboro crossroads includes belfast maryland heights and vista heights dover Aaron Woods, Forest Heights, Forest Lawn, Mulberry Park, Pembroke Meadows, which includes Pembroke Heights Estates, Mountain View, and Southview. Whew, that's a long list. Um, Imagine trying to commit that to memory. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. No. <laughs> I can barely remember my I've name half a couple of times. There you go. Yeah. Um, when did this organization launch? Because you, you've been with the organization, as you just said, for five years. But when did it officially start? It's over 15 years old now, and I'm the first executive director, so it, 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 it evolved. Okay. Um, it was a, a very grassroots, uh, volunteer-driven organization originally, and then they got themselves to the point where it was like, we need a leader, we need a central figure that can 
that can lead it because there was lots of different committees and we still have all those committees we have a, a communications committee we have a diversity committee we have an action committee which is basically your action walks and and those types of things and we have a youth committee so all of those committees were kind of working on their own and there wasn't really a a leader so they decided to hire an executive director and uh, by my luck they chose me so um, we still have all those committees the youth committee does a pink shirt day event every year uh, around February which is when it is uh, so lots of anti-bullying uh, mental health type of uh, stuff we also have a focus on safety which is from the action driven from the action committee and the focus on safety is an educational program we have a couple of videos on our, on our um, uh, YouTube of some of the ones we've done online, but typically we, we would do them in person if not for a pandemic. Uh, and anything from um, uh, emergency preparedness to uh, being a good pet owner to um, frauds and scams. We've done the online frauds and scams, we've done at least three or four times because it is a not only is it a good solid topic, it changes and people always have an interest in learning more about online frauds and scams so that's a big one that we do as well so looking back on the last 15 years and five years as the executive director for yourself what's changed with the organization because i'm assuming when you start an organization uh, about safety and com initiatives and community initiatives there is a mission statement that you plan out and you want to achieve um, and you want to continue on with has that changed since the 15 years? Because we are now living in a more digital world since 2015. We are now living in, in a, well, in the last year and a half, two years, a more COVID world where things have been more adapted to a more online learning. How has the organization changed in the 15 years that it's been around? Well, the mission is so lofty that we'll probably never achieve it. <laughs> it's to, to make our communities free of crime. So it's, it's one of those, you know... Good luck to you. It's a, it's it's a high bar, and I, but I also think it's a good bar to remember. That yeah, that's that's our goal, right? It's it's uh, it, it's to try and prevent crime from happening. It has certainly changed the ebb and flow and evolve from from the addition of the newsletter, uh, which adds to the to our ability to communicate. Um, I also added a Twitter account, which we never had before we got there. Uh, the YouTube channel, which we never had, so how we started the YouTube channel was really interesting and, and goes back to, to your passion, um, <laughs> election. So um, we run election forums, uh, and by the way, not a penny of funding for these election forums. We, you and me both, dude. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> right? So so very, very difficult to find sort of support for those things. So so we do them. So I do it off the side of my desk. We have a group of volunteers that have been doing them for years before I started. But we're very passionate about having those forums because we think it's important to people's safety that they feel like they have a say in their future, right? And so we want to give every candidate the possibility of, um, of, of uh, sharing what they, what they want to do. And I'm proud to tell you that um, last election, this election was impossible, but last election we were the only mayor forum to have every single candidate at. And I'll never forget. So that was 2017, so that was 10 candidates? Yep. Okay. Yeah. And I'll never forget the moment when I had walked in and met one of the candidates for the first time. And it was a week before the election. It was... So we were we were quite proud of that, and, and so we had them. Yeah, we had them all there. Um, and, and I also heard a comment from one of the candidates' wives that I know that she said this was the first one that was open to the general public. Usually they were very, you know, uh, membership-driven, yeah. what have you. You had to be in there. This was totally open to the public. So... Uh, so we're, we, you know, again, the 26 mayoral candidates, that was going to be impossible. And we ended up canceling that, that one anyway, because we ended up with scheduling conflicts. The problem then of the online uh, forums is that it's much easier for people to do them. And it's much easier for people to say, oh, yeah, you know, candidates, I can sit at home and do them and whatever. So then there was so many of these forums that we ended up in conflict and we were going to do ours in person still. Yeah. Um, with and it's hard to do it in person as well because the conflict of 
social distancing and also yeah, COVID-19. Cool. I can imagine that because people, I'd assume, would still want to come and see it. Yeah. But. And our first one was just before they put the regulations in, and which was a trustee forum. So we decided on our own that we were going to require um, uh, people to show their um, vaccination and we kept them social. We did all the stuff that the provincial government ended up putting in later. Yeah. Um, but uh, which was good because then we were able to flow through and, and do those sorts of things. So, um, so yeah. So, so it seems like your mission, while it's to keep safe, it is also to engage and educate, right? right. Like, yeah. it seems like it's a very, not, a, I don't want to say wishy washy, but it seems very uh, fluid. So what was the decision behind making it more fluid and making your organization more adaptable to the ever-changing world that we currently live in? Well, that's part of it, right? The, the, the online nature, but then also the pandemic made us yeah. even more fluid. So we have, we have one of our programs called Community Action Walks, where we go out into community, we have vest, safety vests, and we go out and walk with police and bylaw. So... The average citizen in their neighborhood can ask questions of the police and bylaw. Is this right? Is this wrong? Is this a violation? Is this not? As you walk through the community, well, those of course ended. And so, what do we do? Well, we started putting out uh, a lot of social media posts around being safe, around keeping your eyes out, looking outside, natural surveillance. Uh, a lot of septed comment. I, uh, Septed concepts. Septed is crime prevention through environmental design. For, for don't need to follow up on that question. Yeah, <laughs> septed is a, is a wonderful concept, but but things like natural surveillance. So your front of your street is safer than your back of your street because there's natural surveillance. Your neighbors across the street, your neighbors next door, yourself can see out into the street. So there's that feeling that somebody might be watching me. So we talked to people about while you're in your home have a look out the window see what's going on trim your trees make sure there isn't you know natural hiding places for criminals those types of messages we we started putting out uh during the the early days of covid uh simply because we weren't doing the community action walks and so this was a way to get those those things out in, in a in a timely manner to to all of our folks um, yeah, we, we COVID really forced us to become way more digital, and, and um, we did our, our uh, focus on safeties online and, and Zoom meetings and all that sort of stuff. We've done, uh, we did an anti-racism um, um, program all online with Zoom, which we're now going to turn into a, a film because there was some really good footage we got from it, um, learning about diversity. From different cultures and so we're going to turn that now into a into a film to get to a wider audience uh, we're going to have uh, three pages in our upcoming next four newsletters to teach us white canadians a little bit more about how immigrants um, are how what their experience is like so different cultures are going to share those thoughts in, in our newsletter so there was a lot of stuff we learned about in in uh, during that time that we were able to do online we pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. What has been, I shouldn't say that actually, let's, let's back up here for a second. The the digital age is where people are getting their information. You talk, you, you've been talking about a newsletter. Is it all like, did you still mail it out or is it all digital? No, we mail it out. And, 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 and what's your subscription like? Like, do like, or is there an active well, following on the, we don't, newsletter? we don't ask for subscriptions. We mail it out to 30,000 residents in all of our communities. And I, and I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a, massive massive supporter of, of a thing called synergy the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and especially true when it comes to communication okay so yes digital yes do do every possible social media stream email people do podcasts uh, do videos but there are 
a whole lot of people out there that are not accessing them. And whether it's through uh, non-interest of, of wanting to learn about the digital age or simply an economic thing. So we make sure that everybody has a quarterly newsletter in their hands, in, in the mail, in our communities. I think the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and so you've got to communicate in the way people want to be communicated to, not the way you'd like to communicate. No, and I understand that, and I completely understand that. Um, the, the issue is sometimes mailers don't have the... You, you can never you can never determine the amount of people who actually look at the mailer, right? Yeah, the newsletter. Yeah, because anecdotally, you can. At the end of the day, yes, you can, but you can't say of those thirty thousands, I guarantee you that eighteen thousand of them have actually read from cover to cover, right? Sure. Like I can tell you, like my listenership for each episode because I have data, right? right? And and that's where my life has always been, has been more driven. And I'm not trying, this is not a fight, and I'm just apologizing that. Yeah. Uh, just I just want to make sure that people know that it is true. Like, yeah. there is always going to be a section of the population, even if you mail it out to 30,000, there's that 30,001 person who says, well, I didn't get it. Right. <laughs> exactly. So my it, neighbors didn't get it. <laughs> Exactly. It's, it's. I have the same. In the, I go to the same mailbox they do. They I, just, I get it every issue. My neighbor does. It. Yeah, and he, it, that's, he says he does. It. I don't know, it's the right? weirdest thing, and yeah. you can communicate, communicate, and communicate till the uh, the cows come home. But there's always going to be that one person. I, I told that during the election to some of the candidates, and they're like, "Well, you have to do everything." Then it's like, "Yes, you have to do everything." But at one point in time, you have to just say, "Okay, when is enough enough?" Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you do. You, you have to. You have to take every opportunity to, mm. to do that. I want to turn um, to the future. Okay. Uh, this is coming out at the end of twenty twenty one, potentially at the beginning of twenty twenty two. What does the future hold for twelve CSI? Well, we still will have our uh, our ambassador program going on to through till next August for sure, and then we'll see where it goes from there we're collecting data on that so the data is going to sort of show us where to go with that um i certainly like to get back to in-person events and, and, <laughs> i think uh, we all would at know, this time uh, we would do our focus on safeties in person we get out there and do our community action walks again uh connecting people to community i think one of the things one of the struggles i think over the last I'm going to say 10 to 15 years is really getting people connected to their communities has, has been a very difficult thing for communities. And uh, I think anything we can do to help people get connected to their communities and, and work with their neighbors on emerging issues and, and have avenues. I mean, we, um, a big part of my job is connecting with all levels of government depending on what the issue is, whether it's, you know, a, a police issue, whether we have direct contacts with the police and bylaw, whether it's the city hall, whether it's an MLA, whether it's an MP, there's a number of different um, areas of safety that we can help people channel and connect to to those resources so um the 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 connecting people to the avenue that they can have an impact on their own safety is 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 going to be huge i I wasn't going to plan on asking this question but you brought it up so i'm going to follow along with you here are people becoming more disconnected with their communities in this more digital age and more uh the me first age that we live in it's about me and it's always about me it's about me going to this that or the other and it's i will i I won't take the vaccination i will take the vaccination yeah there's a bit of that and also people are have a short fuse when they are involved in community um if it doesn't go their way or things don't follow through the way they want or um it, it it, it is, and it's funny how people want to call their community and connect with their community too. Um, this is my community. No, this is this is my community, and it's they have different views on what their community is. But I think yeah, there's a there's an awful lot of people that don't even know where their community association is, what it does, or who's involved with it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a history lesson on it though, um, because a lot of people don't talk about this and a lot of people don't know the original community associations were put out 
uh, as a connector to kids' sports. That is how they were funded. That was how they were driven. So whether it was hockey, soccer, baseball, it was all done out of the community associations originally. As things changed, as it became more of a club thing for sports, there was less of a need for community associations. And so now they end up as these um, landlords, for lack of a better term. Uh, rent the hall out so that you can generate enough money and maybe you can have a party or two of your own. And, and then that's kind of evolved into now people looking outside the four walls and trying to impact things within their communities. So there's lots of uh, art projects and, and those sorts of things. So the original intent and how it's kind of moved and flowed has changed who connects with community. It used to be that it was kids and seniors that connected the community. And when I was a community president for five or so years, my question was always, well, how do we get to those people in the middle? Yeah. So we were the first community to put together a, a, beer, a beer fest and okay. we invited five craft breweries and called Northeast Brew Fest. Which community association was that? Crossroads. Crossroads, okay. So after that, a whole bunch of other communities came along and said, hey, can you help me do that? And we basically gave them a template of how we did it. And I think we're up at eight or nine communities have followed suit since then because it fits that middle demographic that you're not connecting with in, in the typical fashion. So. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. We. We knew we have a new council. Yep. It is a brand new council. Uh, while uh, the twelve CSI resides in Ward Nine, which has a returning in and ten, and parts of ten. Yeah, yeah. The top, the top four communities: Crossroads, Marlboro, Marlboro Park, and Abbeydale. I knew that, and I live in ten. I totally. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure that Larry was doing his research. Oh God. <laughs> Um, okay, so part of Ward 9 Ward 10, uh, part of 10, well, um, all of Ward 9? Well, well, uh, the majority of Ward 9. Well, we got eight Because you don't do Ramsey and in, right. in Inglewood and downtown, but... Yeah, um, probably half. Okay. Give or take. Yeah. Is there... You're the only organization that I've heard of that does this. I, I can honestly tell you... There isn't another organization in the world that I can say we are like X. No, not not that. But there's no nine CSI for Whitehorn, Temple, right. Rundle, yeah. Pine Ridge. Yeah. Is there plans, or would you like to see maybe not next year or the year after, but maybe in the future to start expanding a little bit further outside of those twelve? Or are you, are is is the twelve CSI organization happy with what they have now? Because I. I looked at your model. I looked at what you do, and you guys do fantastic work. Thank you. But is there plans to go further? Is there plans? Because I know you did do Ward 10's debate. Yeah. You did uh, Calgary Skyview's federal debate, if I'm not mistaken. No. No. No, okay, maybe We're not. Calgary Forest Lawn. Forest Lawn. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. So is there a plan to go further? Because I think there's a vacuum that people are looking for this type of information, that they're looking for safety help, that are looking for community outreach, but no one wants to pick up the baton and run it themselves. They want people to do it for them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I've been asked this question before. I presented at the Alberta Crime Prevention Conference uh, six months ago or so, or so, and I got that question. And I, I think I'll answer it the same way as I answered it that time, is that there are so many things that we still could do that we're not doing around crime prevention. Yeah. There's still so much to expand within the 12 that we have that I would say you would want to have a completely separate other organization. And much like the Brewfest I was just talking about, here's the template. Um, we'll help you, right? We'll help you get organized. And um, the... 
the model is there. It's been there for 15 years. Um, it'll continue to be there. Um, I think that is the best way to, to sort of expand it if we were able to is, is that somebody else take on a 10 CSI in another um, yeah. district of, of CPS. And, uh, and, I, and I know we have really good relationships with, uh, with the superintendent of community policing uh, and as well as the head of crime prevention. He was the district four uh, head of the, um, I, I, was, I was about to say an acronym again, CRO. <laughs> And now I'm trying to think community resource officer. Okay. So the, they have officers that connect to community associations. So the district four had who we worked with directly is now the head of crime prevention. So we have, we have those folks in place. And if they felt that they were hearing from other communities, that there was an interest, uh, I, I pretty sure they would come to us and go, Hey, you need to meet this guy. And, and, and see see how they can help you but I think that's that that's the only way I can see us sort of expand I can't I can't see it become a 24 CSI or no like <laughs> understandable it's, yeah it's it, it, it I, I even find sometimes there's like oh yeah that community is part of us because there's sometimes we don't touch every community with everything that we do and so sometimes uh, it's even tough to get out to the 12 that we have um you have set up a entity that has helped a lot of people that has given back to the community by teaching education that community building i want to ask the question and it might sound stupid but i'm going to ask it anyway because there's no stupid questions on this show as you if anyone's ever listened to the show longer than 10 minutes they know that i ask stupid questions but i got i like stupid questions from time to time you have set up a great organization. While we talk about the good, let's talk about some some things that you want to try and pick up for 2022. Like you, you mentioned there for a second that there are things that we do want to do, but we haven't gotten to it yet. What are some of those things? Well, we we put out uh, we put out grant requests and had some failures. Things like um, there's a there's a concept that we'd like to build called ITED inclusion through environmental design you are based. just the king of acronyms today <laughs> like my my listeners are probably i'm just gonna have to list a like a whole, all the acronyms but below in the an show acronym i invented so okay I tell you exactly <laughs> even about. better because nobody else is gonna know what it's talking about so when we talk about crime prevention through environmental mm -hmm. design we want to do inclusion through environmental design so we want to set up a program do some focus groups uh and get people together uh from all walks of life literally walks and unwalks people who are you know in a wheelchair say and are disabled in some way uh, so we want to put together a program where you can walk into a space whether it's an outdoor space or an indoor space and you can evaluate it on a, on a, a number of questions that you would ask about is it this is it that so you might end up at the end of the report saying oh uh, this space needs uh, gender neutral bathrooms or this space needs a ramp or this space needs to look at feng shui or a whole host of different uh, things that make people feel included right so that we want to put that together as a and it and it's not been done in the world yet so we we would be sort of groundbreaking putting that together so that that's one thing no and i appreciate that yeah. because it it goes into my uh sort of my last area of conversation before we wrap up here on this one um you have talked about being safe in your communities in your five years as executive director in 15 years as the organization 12 CSI has been around, what is the one thing that you have seen over and over again that you, you look and you say, if people just only did X, they'd be more safe. If people just did Y, they'd be more safe. What is the one reoccurring thing that people do that they don't uh, subconsciously think about, but they should be to make them more safe? Report crime. How, why? Because resources from the CPS, from bylaw, 
etc., are based on data. <laughs> <coughs> and if you don't report the crime, they don't have the data in which to find what may go on. So I had my shed broken into last year, had a power washer stolen. Mm -hmm. I'm not crying. It's not the end of the world. A couple hundred bucks, I can have another power washer. But that's not the point. The point is I need to report, and you can do it online. You don't have to sit on hold forever. You can report online, these items were stolen from my shed at this time. If my neighbor does it, and the neighbor down the street who got ripped off the same week, and then they, and then they can start to see a pattern. And then with that pattern, they might actually catch that person. And you might actually get your power washer back. But you're also preventing your neighbor from losing his power washer and the guy in the next community who they were going to hit next and so on and so forth. So reporting crime is absolutely essential. I've sat in rooms and listened to people, uh, a forum, like a, 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 a safety forum we put on, and people yelling and screaming about this happened and that happened. Did you report it? No. Did you report it? No. Well, <laughs> it's very difficult for, for anybody, especially the police, to help keep you safer if they don't know what's going on. Yeah. So report crime, number one. Um, the other end of reporting crime that I think is important, Chris, is that you're respecting your neighborhood, right? So if you have an expectation that your neighbors and your neighborhood should look in a certain way, and it's not, and something's happened, if you don't report it, then that says, that's okay. That's okay that that happened in my neighborhood. To, to, that, to, to the devil's advocate in me, though... Um, we're not talking about tattling, though, are we? Because no. I think that at the end of the day, I think a lot of people, and that's where I think a lot of people, if they see something that's going on in the neighborhood, whether it be an unsightly property, whether it be yeah. X, Y, or Z, they're afraid because yeah. you have to live beside your neighbors for the rest of your, until someone moves, until someone blinks an eye and moves. So I think there's a concern there, and I just want to know from your perspective, how do you get people over that fear that if I tattle on my neighbors, if I report this that looks not okay to me, that I'm doing it for not only myself, but for everyone on the street? Yeah, I think I think if you if you polled the five neighbors around them, yeah. they would all want to have that particular property look better. Yeah. And so yeah, you'd be doing it for the neighborhood, you'd be doing it for the neighbors. There there is a line, right? And and everybody's got a different line <laughs> yeah. aware of, of what they're willing to it accept. Put up with yeah. right. Um but even crimes, like even stuff gets stolen, my fence got broken into, my car got broken into, oh, they didn't steal anything. Well, no. If your window got smashed and they went through and, and got 37 cents a change out of your car, report it. Yeah. Because of the, the trends. That, that kind of stuff has to be reported. There's no gray area there. But the bylaw stuff, absolutely. There, there becomes... There, there is a certain standard that a community will will want, and at that point, that's the point where you got to make the call. That, that that's not that's not what our neighborhood is is going to accept. And uh, yeah, I appreciate that, and I appreciate your honesty there. Um, to to sort of wrap this all up uh, in a nice, neat little bow here. Um, for those who are listening within the 12 CSI area, the 4th District of the Calgary Police Service, how can people get involved? How can people learn more about the organization? Because I think while we we can do our show, you can send out the newsletter, there's always more that we can always do, right? So how can people get it and get involved but also learn a little bit more? At this point, send me an email. That, that's the <laughs> best way. Um, you know... Our, our, our ambassadors are out on International Avenue, so if you're out there, say hi to them. Uh, let them know uh, that, that uh, you heard, heard me on the, on the podcast. Um, as well, we are going to hopefully start 
maybe in the new year of having our monthly meetings again. And so we would meet once a month with all the different committees and come on and sit on a committee and, and join join the youth committee if that's what you want to impact or, or join the action committee if you want to get involved in community action walks. And I can tell you not every community in our 12 uh, has somebody that's willing to st step up and host the community action walk. So if you're in Pembroke, if you're in Forest Lawn, if you're in Forest Heights, um, those are communities that uh, that we don't have a point person that's that, you know that's come up and help us organize them. So as long as we have a person from each of the communities willing to sort of you know set up a date and time and and uh, get it, we'll bring all all what you need, and uh, including the police and, and bylaw, and we'll get out there and have a walk. Um, so yeah, join it, join a committee. I think, and as well, we're uh, our AGM's coming up in November, and if anybody has uh, any interest in, in joining our board and being more on the governance side, uh, either somebody that has board experience already or somebody that wants to learn about how uh, governing an organization, a nonprofit organization is, um, you can send me an email, Larry at 12CSI, pretty simple uh, email. Our emails are real simple, first name at csi.ca dot ca yeah. um for those who have watched the show or listened to the show uh you know what i'm about to say next the information is in the show notes uh if you're watching this via youtube scroll down literally just take your mouse scroll down a bit and you will see the links to 12 csi's website but also the social media uh facebook and twitter but also larry's email larry at 12 csi ca so please check it out i highly recommend it and then also and i'm going to give you a kind of a side, a kind of a side plug here but if you're looking at setting up this type of organization in your community in your area i, I would highly recommend reach out to larry because like he said he has the blueprints he has the templates he has the idea so you, you don't need to start from the bottom you can literally start from the middle and work your way up so um Larry, I, I will say this. Uh, thank you so much for this. Thank you. It's always great to highlight community groups, but also talk about communities that sometimes we don't know who's behind them, right? And it's always great to have that person come in and talk about their organization. Always happy to chat about our group. <laughs> Um, for everyone here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast, you know what I'm about to say next. Uh, follow us on this, uh, in the show notes as well. But if you're watching this via YouTube, hit that subscribe button. And also, just also, uh, have yourself an excellent rest of the day. And just go talk to somebody. Get off social media for five minutes and just go have a conversation. Because you might learn something and you might just discover that we do live in one of the greatest cities in this, in this country. Larry, go find 12 CSI's YouTube channel too. <laughs> there you go. Subscribe to 12 <laughs> CSI's YouTube channel. That will be in the show, show notes as well. Um, for everyone here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast, have yourself an excellent rest of your Tuesday. And we will be back Wednesday morning with another great guest. Talk to you later, guys. Yeah.